Jake Asman and Dan Budick break down the world of sports right here, right now on VIC Radio. And that's us. Welcome back to another edition, a very special edition of the Asman and Budick Show. Jake Asman alongside Dan Budick. And we are joined in studio with a good friend of ours. Uh, you see him everywhere around the <laughs> community of Sarasset, not so much in the Ithaca area. He's <laughs> practically the first ever Cornell commuter student all the way from Long Island. But Josh Lavazan is with, uh, with us. Excuse me. We said that we were going to do this interview for a while now. We figured it's campaign season. Why not have Josh in to talk about our hometown, Sarasset, and really get the latest what's going on with the community there. So, Josh, how are you? I'm doing well. First of all, it's weird seeing you guys up here. I know we've been friends back home, and now we're friends up in Ithaca. But uh, I'm grateful to be here, and I appreciate you guys having me on the show. Yeah, well, again, we, you know, we've been talking about doing this for a couple months already, I feel like, just getting Josh on, talking about the campaign. First off, how's the campaign coming? Uh, Votes coming around. The campaign is wonderful. The support that I've received from the Sayasa community, again, because, you know, I was elected in 2012, um, the support in 2015 has been overwhelming. People reaching out, stopping me on the basketball court in the supermarket, telling me they love my fight, my fight for fiscal sustainability, my fight for increased technology, my my fight for increased transparency and accountability. So the support has been overwhelming, and I, I can't say enough about the people of Syosset. Now, what's different this time around? Obviously, we'll get into what happened in 2012 in just a little bit, but you're back campaigning again, but it's for re-election this time. What's different about your process going about your re-election this time around? So clearly it's much easier to run for re-election than it is to run for election. Running as an incumbent, you already have high name recognition. People already know you. They know what you're about. So it's really what's different is that the first time I had to energize my base. This time, I have to re-energize people. Uh, as, a, as an incumbent, you know, I do have higher name recognition, so it's easier. But right now, we're focusing on a couple of things. We're focusing on re-energizing the youth. You know, young people are the most underrepresented demographic in government. And it's not because we don't have the numbers. Millennials are the largest group in the world and in America. But it's because they don't vote. So we're re-energizing young people. We're you know, mobilizing our troops. And we're getting the word out to every home in Syosset that if you want to ensure that Syosset thrives, you need to vote for number three, number four, and number five. You talked about number three, number four, and number five. Tell us about the other two uh, uh, the other two candidates that you're endorsing and that you're running on your ballot. Sure. So I'm on ballot position number four. And I'm running with two other gentlemen who are going to make extraordinary trustees. Andy Feldman is at number three. He's a financial planner who works in Syosset, uh, Andrew Feldman Associates. And then Seth Hart is number five. He's a vice president over at Morgan Stanley. And together, the f- incredible financial background and the, their financial expertise are going to allow them to make a seamless transition into a job uh, whose primary goal is to allocate money in the budget. That's pretty much the largest job that any board trustee takes on. So it's going to allow them to make a seamless transition they both have kids in the district. They're invested in this district. They've both coached sports for many years. They're dedicated parents, and they're going to be great to work with on the board. Now, obviously, you've always talked about how you want to see more people with business and more financial backgrounds on the board. Why are these two candidates that you're endorsing? Even though you've already won before, you've been on the school board, you're running for re-election. These guys, as you said, they got to get the energy. they got to get the support from their base. Why are they qualified candidates? So they're qualified candidates. Well, first and foremost, the school board only has a couple of... Of, um, mandated responsibilities from the state to employ a superintendent and you know and, and a couple other mandated duties. But the biggest duty that a school board member has is to approve the budget. Um, we have a 215 million dollar budget. It's yeah, a lot of money. It's, it is a lot of money. It's and it's, it's growing at an unsustainable rate. And I'll get to that in a minute. But 215 million dollars. We don't have one person who works in finance on this board. Now, how can this be possible that a budget as large as the Sasset budget does not have people qualified? in finance on the school board? It's a very simple answer. Remember, I ran in 2012. For five years before I ran, there were uncontested elections. People were afraid, and people didn't want to risk you know, their kids and their reputations running against Har- Carol Is that how scary it was? That's how Carol Hankin was ruthless. She was a ruthless tyrant. And for people that don't know, who's Carol Hankin? Because not everyone might be aware who's listening right now. Sure. Carol Hankin was our former superintendent for 23 years. And, and let me say this. She was a fierce advocate for education. Nobody can ever take that away from her. But she also, you know, really was the antithesis of inclusive. She scared the community away. And I've heard from several people that she tried to dissuade them from running for the board. And remember, in January of 2012, she came to me. 
And she said, Josh, if you don't say anything negative about me, I will endorse you for this board. You will be on my ticket. And you turned her down. I turned her down because I am not beholden to anybody. And when I was elected in May, it would be very easy to just sit there and raise my hand yes for every vote. I wasn't elected to sit there. I was elected to do something. And I fought Hank in my first year. And things are getting better. We have a great, we have a rock star superintendent in Dr. Rogers, but we're not taking action. That's why these two are qualified. They're ready to take action. Now, in 2012, a lot of your campaign was about Carol Hank and salary, sure. and how you need to stop high salaries sure. of administrators in the size of school district. This time around, you're running on different, a different platform. You're running on different things and more of what you can do in your second term as a school board member. Sure. Does your approach change at all, change at all with how you go about getting reelected? Well, it's funny. You know, as I said, Doctor, I'm, I'm the biggest fan of our superintendent. I have such admiration for Dr. Rogers. He makes half of what... Carol Hankin made, and he's wonderful. But the problem of egregious administrative contracts has not, it's not passed. Our deputy superintendent is still the highest paid deputy superintendent in the state, and worse, he makes more than our superintendent. It's ludicrous, and of nine board members on this board, I was the only board member to vote no on that contract in uh, last year. So that, that problem has not escaped us, but the focus of this campaign is really about moving Syosset into the 21st century with education reforms and ensuring Syosset's financial sustainability so that future generations can enjoy the very same programs and the very same education that we enjoy. Josh, how is it possible, and I guess this is just from an outside perspective, how is it possible that a deputy superintendent is making more than the superintendent of a school district? I mean, I, you know, again, I don't have expertise in, 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 in being, on a school, being on a school board and contracts, but sure. doesn't that seem a little weird? Well, it seemed weird to me, weird enough, <laughs> weird enough that I cast my vote no, but the, the weird part is that after all the controversy surrounding the high salary of our superintendent, I was the only board member to vote no. Now, we cannot dwell on the past. The contract was approved. However, what Seth and Andy agree with me is that going forward, enough is enough. Residents have spoken, and they have spoken clearly. They are tired of being in Newsday as having the highest paid administrators. We were criticized from Newsday to State Comptroller Tom Denapoli for being too top-heavy. An idol of yours. And oh, Tom, Tom, and he. Uh, if you if you want to talk about that briefly, you know, Tom DiNapoli is the consummate public servant. Um, Tom was elected to his school board at 18 in Mineola uh, in 1972, and we go back and forth over whether who was younger. He likes to think he was younger. I think I was younger, and <laughs> I think I you know I defer to him, you know, because he's the senior member. But he has been a role model for me, uh, and he's a state comptroller. But remember, the state comptroller's office a few years back criticized Sayas for being too top heavy. It's time we heed that advice. Yeah. Oh, I was just going to say, Josh, uh, 2012 when you ran, there was a lot of media attention around this yes. election. It, it was in Newsday. It was on Fox. It was on Fox Business. It was on Spreecast. It, 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 yeah, Spreecast, it was of course. Who it, forget it was everywhere. Sure. Obviously, not as much hype this time. Well, not as, not not the hype, but it's not as it's not as widely uh, talked about, I guess, in the news. Is that uh, does that concern you at all? The fact that the school district's not getting that attention it got in 2012? No, it doesn't it doesn't concern me at all. And really, you know. When I was running at 18, you know, it, it was it was twofold. It was one, it was a human interest story. I was 18, I was becoming the youngest elected official in New York. But also, too, remember, it was David versus Goliath. It was David versus Goliath. It was Josh Lafazan versus Carol Hankin. That's a huge story. I mean, you were, uh, as Newsday quoted it, a rebel with a cause. Yes, and I, I know you guys like to call me that all the time when you're <laughs> on the phone. So, uh, look, I embrace that title because I do have a cause, and my cause is ensuring this district's sustainability. But regarding the lack of media attention, we've, we've you know, while the media has picked up there is hype in the community people are talking and people you know lawn signs are everywhere people are making phone calls for us people are all over facebook talking about us people are excited that for the first time in a while we're going to get some people on this board who are ready to take action now josh people know you fought carol hankin it was we stan just said it was everywhere in the media it was the biggest story in 2012 you were on the cover of news Day, for god's sake <laughs> what are some of the other accomplishments that maybe people don't know about what you did in your first term because when people think of your first term they might think that oh carol hankin retired a year year into it. But what are some of the other things you did in your first term that you plan on also doing when if you're reelected in your second term? Sure. Well, uh, you know, one of the cool things I did in my first term, which people don't know about, but, you know, it's close to home because I'm an avid sports fan and we're on the show. I know we're going to talk sports. In a little bit. <laughs> but, you of know, course. In, in the in the Hankin era, we didn't allow MSG Varsity and Files 1 to tape our sports. And that was one of the first motions I made on this board was to allow them to come tape our sports and, you know, and sports and clubs. And it's been wonderful. The Mats of Pequa game the other day, you know, tough loss, but we had them there and we have them filming. You know, we have an incredible forensics teams and Model UA 
UN and Science Olympiad, so that was one thing I did. Something I did that was really important is I passed a motion to do a comprehensive digital audit of our buildings. 21st century involves Wi-Fi and broadband. Most school districts across the country are what's called 3 to 1 or 5 to 1. It's devices to kids. So if I have a cell phone, a tablet, and a laptop, and I'm sure you guys have a bunch of devices as well, your school should have the broadband capability and the Wi-Fi speed to be able to handle that. So I passed a comprehensive digital audit. We're still in the process of looking at where our buildings are in terms of Wi-Fi and broadband capability. And the next step is analyzing ways to make improvements so we can become 3 to 1 or 5 to 1. Now, you mentioned we're going to talk sports. So let's get to that right now because I know one of the things that you're campaigning for is a new turf field at the yeah. Sass at high school. Uh, Absolutely. How does that get done? And that raises the question of direct donations. Why is it that our school district does not accept direct donations when other school districts do, and that allows them to be able to fund outstanding athletic facilities, which Syosset, unfortunately, despite the fact that they're having one of the best years they've ever had athletically, Mm -hmm. does not have top-notch facilities. Sure. And let me give a plug for Drew Cronin. Drew is our athletic director, and we are so lucky. New athletic director. New athletic director, and and we are so lucky to have him. Um, You know, Syosset, you know, we lead the world in everything. You know, we have, we, we always have, you know, you know, we're always to the top of, you know, the most Intel semifinalists, most National Honor Society members, but when it comes to sports, you know, really, Hankin didn't spend a cent, and the reason our, you know, our sports are really, you know, our sports facilities are really lackluster is because Hankin didn't spend a cent, we had Dr. Friedman for a year, he had his plate full, and Tom Rogers hasn't even been here for a full year, so for me, it's time to move out of the past and get into the future. Manhasset and Cold Spring Harbor, two districts in Nassau County, both have athletic facilities fully funded by direct donations. There is no reason that Syosset can't can't explore to replicate a similar policy where we could allow directed donations. And the idea I have is, I'm, okay, this is a, you guys have been to City Field, right? Of course. Uh, well, I know we have a Yankee fan over here, so I'm just double checking. I've been, I've been to the Shake Shack in City Field. Okay, you've been to the Shake Shack. Well, if you stroll in the front of the building, you guys know they have the bricks with the people's names on them. Yes. Absolutely. So what happened is people paid money for those bricks, and they raised a ton of money. And it probably went to player salaries or administrative salaries. But why can't Sayasa do something similar where we raise money in that fashion and it could pay for the entire facility, or at least a 50-50 split. Why aren't we exploring things like that? Why aren't we aggressively, right now, looking to fund... I'll tell you right now, if you way. tell the community of Syosset that, that the opportunity to get a turf field, you would need a couple people or a bunch of people to contribute to some sort of project to raise money, they would do it. If people it, value athletics in, well, in I, I, I think, yeah, I agree, absolutely, people value athletics, but if you're in Syosset, I mean, the, the facilities are old. They're old facilities. You talk about the lo- from the locker rooms to the, to the uh, to the football field. Look, and, and I also want to address, because the girls' softball team, they spoke at our meeting uh, last month about inequity between girls and boys' teams, and that exists, and that's a problem with me. And, Especially know, I, with certain sports. Yes. Because, let, let me ask you, and there's a thing, some sports have their booster club, sure. which raise a lot of money, but it seems like outside of the booster club for individual teams, which, listen, that's, that's 95% parents-based. Yes. So why is it that most of the money for these athletic, for new jerseys, new, you know, new uh, uh, helmets for certain sports. Why is that coming from the boosters? Why is it necessarily coming from the district? Well, once again, for 23 years, we had a superintendent by the name of Carol Hankin, who admittedly didn't spend a cent on sports facilities. That's why they're crumbling. There's a huge movement in the community to get this done, but remember, there's nine people who can really get this done, and they're on the school board of education. Andy and Seth have coached sports in Syosset for over, over two, for I think, 10 and 11 years, respectively. Um, th- you know, They're both avid sports fans, and they came to me and they said, why are our athletic facilities decrepit? And the answer is because we never spent a cent. And we need to look aggressively and right so now. So if you're reelected, is that something that you're going to work on immediately? That's a big component for you, improving athletic facilities. At it's at the top of my priority list. There is, It's embarrassing. It's embarrassing. Uh, look, I love Syosset. It is my home. I was senior class president. I was a volunteer firefighter there. It is. I, I, I love Syosset, but it is embarrassing that we don't have a turf field. In 2015, it is embarrassing that we don't have a turf field. That is at the top of my priority list to figure out how to get it done without hurting the taxpayers. If we can do that, whether it's via donations or whether it's grants or sponsorships or however we do it without hurting the taxpayers, that's at the top well, of my Josh, priority list. Well, Josh, the the thing is, is you talk about direct donations and uh, you know. The way we've talked about it and the way Syasa does things is you could donate money, but you can't dictate to the district how they are going to spend that money you do you donate. Is that correct? Correct. So you can't earmark. Well, let me give you an example. To Brickishaw Ferguson, 
in, or you know, to break for example, in Freeport, you know, he donated, you know, it's a beautiful facility. It's gorgeous. It's gorgeous. But if Evan Capados, who's one of my good friends, if he, you know, goes pro in football, and I'm pulling for you, Evan, if you're listening, if he goes pro in football, he makes it big, and he wants to donate that facility here. He can't earmark that money for a specific project. It's got to go to the general fund, and that's a simple policy change that Seth and I. So, that, agree so why do you feel that? That why do you feel that something so simple as that has taken this long, or it's it's been you know you mentioned 23 years of Hankin, and now a couple of years after, why is it not? go to fruition? Why are we still it's, waiting for that? Quite frankly, it's it's another example of just a board that I believe is too often happy with the status quo and not looking to... Uh, they're not urgent to make change. Look, I, Is it afraid? Is it afraid to make change? It's just a lack of urgency. And uh, some of it is fear, but some of it is just a lack of urgency. I'm 21. I make no secret about my ambition for higher office. And about the timeline for me to get higher office. I don't, you know, th- this is not a position I'm going to have until I'm 60. You know, I want to, I, I want to, you know, run for New York State government and then hopefully run for Congress. But I'm never going to get there unless I do a great job here. So I have urgency to make a real change here to run on that later. So that's my urgency. Seth and Andy, their urgency is that they have young kids in the district. They want the changes. They want to make change now. They have young kids. They have skin in the game. A lot of the board members without young kids in the district, they don't have urgency to make change. I want to make change now. Now, what are you going to propose just switching to the the idea of saving money? You mentioned that the mm-hmm. school district budget, over $200 million. Sure. How do we cut back? Or if we're not cutting back, how do we better spend our money to get better value for our buck? So I'll tell you what. We waste a ton of money in a lot of places. And the number one place we waste money is energy. $3 million last year was spent on, on electric and natural gas alone. So why not look to explore hiring an ESCO? Why not look to explore – my whole mantra is – is that we should look to explore green energy initiatives with short ROI periods. ROI means return on investment. So the money you spend, you get back in one to three years. LED lighting, let's explore that. Let's, ex- you know, we have, this kind of transitions into another thing I want to do. You know, committees. We have some really talented professionals and energy in this committee. Let's get them in a room together. Let's let them tour the buildings and let's let them give us our recommendations because $3 million for electric and natural gas is way too much. And that's a big way of money. Josh is talking about Hart and Feldman. You're running on you're running on a battle with them. Why run with two other people? Why did you feel that or it was to running with two other people, but these two people to run with, as opposed to you running alone? Because after 2012, you have a big following and 82 percent of the vote. 82 percent of the vote. Is it? I mean, I can't imagine you're, you would be worried about not getting elected. What was it to make you bring Hart and Feldman on as as to run with them on the ballot? Sure. So you, you know. I, I oscillated back and forth between what I wanted to do, and you know I decided to run with two other people, quite frankly because I'm, I'm sick and tired of not being able to get anything done. My agenda is bold, my agenda is for the 21st century, and my agenda is not being able to come to fruition because we have board members who, in my opinion, are too, either, either as you said, afraid to make change or too comfortable with the status quo, and it's a numbers game. It's a nine-person board. You need five votes on anything to pass a motion, so I need numbers. And this year, you, you know, I, I went to Seth and Andy, and, you know, I've, they're friends for a while, and, they, you know, we've spoken in the past because they're just, you know, sick of their tax bill, you know, doubling in, you know, 10, 15 years doubling. It's an unsustainable rate of growth. And I spoke to them about my ideas. And, you know, specifically, I pitched them on my on my foreign language program. And did you guys take, you guys took language in elementary school, right? You took land and through middle school and high school. Uh, okay, so do you remember how you kind of switched languages? It was like every, every year in middle school, in, in elementary school. Right. It was every year. Sure. And let me ask you, did did, did you retain anything from that? No, I, I honestly couldn't. Yeah. Well, I didn't join the district till fifth grade, but we we did Greek, and I don't that's remember okay. Greek. That's okay. And, and, what, and what language did you guys take in middle school? I took Spanish. Talent. And can you speak conversational or fluent Italian? <laughs> no. Or Spanish? Not at all. Not, not, no. I if really can't. If I dropped can. you in the middle of Madrid, could you get your way around? Without a doubt, no. And if I dropped you in Florence? Nope. That's a major problem. So I went to Seth and Andy. My, my, my real, one of my number one initiatives is changing the emphasis in our foreign language program from cultural to conversational. Right now, we switch between languages every year in elementary school. You take a different language and you learn about the culture. But to me, the, the research shows that the golden age of language language acquisition is seven plus or minus two years. So we got to start with kids in kindergarten or first grade. We got to give them a language and let them stick with it through fifth grade. And hopefully they're going to stick with it through middle school and high school. And what is going to be the result? Just like in Europe and just like in China, 
Kids are going to enter middle school conversational, and if they stick with it, they're going to have a shot at exiting high school either bilingual or if they have it in them, trilingual. That is power. If Sayasit can produce graduates that are bilingual or trilingual, they are going to be powerhouses in the job market. Because even as the United States State Department, one of the most prestigious places to work in government, said, there's a shortage of people who speak fluent foreign languages coming out of our schools. Let's heed that advice. So I went to Seth and Andy, and I said, how do you think about that? They both loved it. They both think that we're really not getting to our full potential with our foreign language program. But the fact that they came back with ideas of their own is what made me really impressed with them. The fact that they had ideas of their own to make you know to, to make change in education, that was enough for me. So just just so the listener is clear, you you were suggesting that a child is pushed through a kindergarten, they pay, they select the language and or their parents select the language parents, and yeah. and they stick with that because obviously seven eight year old they don't no, ha- right. comprehend what what necessarily is the right thing to do. So uh, their yeah. parents choose say a kid chooses to speak Spanish, they progress on Spanish every year until and, fifth grade. But yeah, and and right till fifth grade. But m- most importantly is that you know we, the emphasis becomes conversation. You know the emphasis right now is culture, but y- you know we really need to teach conversation because conversation, the cultural skills you can you can research culture and you can travel. The conversational skills need to be built right away. So absolutely. So we should offer either a, you know a couple you know what, what we should have you know I want to have an educational committee to decide what the languages are to be offered. Offer those languages, allow the kids to stick with it, K to five, and my hope is that if we explain to parents how important it is that they stick with it through middle school and high school, I mean, our kids are going to be dynamite coming out of high school, and they're going to be very, very attractive in the job market. Now, Josh, as we sit here on May 6th, the election, of course, it's on May 19th, I believe. Is yes, that correct? Yes, that is. Are you going to be there? I, I will be there. I will be there. <laughs> of course. Are you going to be there? Of course. Well, Where, uh, would I be anywhere else? No, no, no. I, well, at Applebee's afterward. Uh, yes, the post Applebee. Ass- assuming there's a victory to be celebrating yes, here. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We're confident. Now, what is the what is the process the rest of the way? We're about two weeks out of the election. How do you feel mentally? And what do you what is your plan as far as wrapping up schoolwork here in Ithaca yep. and headed back to Sarasota to be able to be a part of the campaign down the stretch? Sure. So, um, I you know m- my professors have been wonderful at, at Cornell. Actually, one of my professors was elected to his school board at 18 in New Jersey. So really? Wow. Yeah, what a coincidence. Such a coincidence. And he's very empathetic to my situation. So I've moved up all my finals and I'm, I'm actually wrapping up school um, either Friday or Saturday I can't miss Mother's Day I'm, such, I'm, I'm a, an admittedly you know a self-proclaimed mama's boy you know, I am, oh so you'll be home just in time I'll be, I, 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 I couldn't miss Mother's Day but, but I've moved up all my finals and um, you know, after, you know after, after Mother's Day the festivities you know we have you know really eight days you know to pound the pavement to you know final push to get the word out vote three four and five if you want Syatsi to thrive, vote for financial sustainability. So really the plan is to you know continue to get the word out, distributing flyers, making phone calls, having people send emails on our behalf, speaking to your neighbors, getting the lawn signs up. It's the same game plan we've been doing, but it's accelerated. The difference is like you two, we got an army of college kids coming home who are going to help us out. Bring in the cavalry because we have a ton of people who are going to be able to help us out. We're going to spread this word far and wide. Josh, you talked a little about uh, your professors up here. You obviously attend Cornell. University, your first year there. Mm-hmm. Now, you graduated high school, you jump on the school board, you went to Nassau Community College for two years. I did. So, what was the benefit, or what has been the difficulties or advantages mm-hmm. of coming all the way up to Ithaca, New York? It's a high, it can be a hike from Long Island. It's a schlep. What are the advantages or disadvantages of having that, being up here doing your schoolwork, but also having to be in the state of mind to be in Syosset and be involved in what's going on there? It's difficult. It's difficult, and it was a transition, of of course, going to Nassau, I commuted, so I was home all the time. Um, when I got into Cornell, I could not turn it down. It was I got into you know the School of Industrial and Labor Relations, such a prestigious school, and what I'm learning up here translates so well into what I'm going to do. It's all you know, it's learning about collective bargaining and the world of work, and I have such a better understanding. And important to note that two commissioners right now, Gary Bettman yep. of the NHL yes. and Rob Manfred of Major League Baseball, LIR graduates of the course. And, and school. Gary Bettman actually was the brother of the Beta chapter of Alpha Epsilon Pi. Was he so actually? I, I didn't know that. Wow. Of my fraternity, so we're very, you know we're very proud to you know claim him um but yeah so you know going here you know 
it was too good of an opportunity, and I would grow so much intellectually if I came here. And I, you know, I, I've really been intellectually challenged here, and it's more than the classes; it's the kids I'm surrounded with. Um, you know, everybody is brilliant up here, and you know, the opportunity for me to kind of immerse myself in such an amazing school, I've grown tremendously. And the only downside is that it's a schlep back to Syosset, but I do it, and I've been dis- I've been disseminating this message. The reason I do it is because I love my job on the school board. I know that I can make a real difference. I know I am making a real difference. So, it's been a lot of miles on my car. My easy pass bill is very high. (laughs) I mean, sometimes it's twice a week you're making the trip. It is, it is, but it's worth it. Because I really believe in what we're doing. What we're doing is is we're making a difference in the lives of kids and in the lives of taxpayers. And and that, 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 you know... That that's why I do this. Remember, you know, as I said, I'm 21. You know, I don't want to live with mom and dad till I'm 30. But if we don't get this budget under control, and if we don't get these taxes under control, and if we don't start to save money and put ourselves on a sound fiscal path, I'm never going to be able to live in Syosset. You two, never going to be able to live. It's in very, it's extremely expensive. Young people, never going to be able to live on Long Island, and the entire thing fails. And I'm not ready to let that happen. And it's time. As I said, young people are the most underrepresented demographic in government. We need the next generation to step up, claim responsibility, and take action to save this thing. I'm doing it here. We have a bunch of people in other districts. My friend Adam Sakowitz is 21 or 22. Sorry, Adam, I forgot, but you're running, he's running in East Meadow. Matthew Clarine is 21. He's running right now in Islip. Peter Mountainos was 18 when he was elected in Montauk. One of my best friends, Anthony Fasano, was the vice president of his board in Hopatcon, New Jersey. Young people are stepping up and running. So, so with that, you see people running. Do they seek advice? from you being you were the youngest elected well, official in well, New York always, State always and it's one of the favorite it's you know it's, it's one of my favorite things to do and I'll, and I'll give a plug book here so I you, you guys know I'm writing a book uh, do, of course we know and uh, you know I'm writing a book and you know it's about young people getting into politics and of course it's about when is that supposed to be coming out sure so I'm hoping to, actually so my brother Justin uh, is actually writing a book as well so we're hoping to do a co-launch at the end of the summer which is very exciting so the book's actually going to come out at the end of the summer we're hoping yeah we're hoping yeah and you have a, a publisher set and a, how, how is that process going along logistically you know, it, it's a difficult process I'm, I'm a neophyte in this so you know I've sought counsel from you know Nikhil Goyle who's a veteran and you know people who are veterans in in writing books and um so logistically it's it, you know that'll come but you know re- right now it's just been focusing on you know writing the book and what i've done is i've interviewed scores of elected officials from across the country and essentially this book is a roadmap for how do you run for office you know you there's literature out there for how to run for office but running as a young person it is so much different than running as an adult because you face way more criticism. It's tough to get your name out. You don't have as much funding to run. So how do you do it? And what I hope this book will do is inspire many more young people to run or to just start thinking about running because we need the next generation to step up and take control of things. Now, you mentioned a lot of criticism and getting back to the the idea of you being able to be on the school board while still being a full-time student sure. in Ithaca, New York, five hours away from Syosis. Yes. Do you have your distractors tried to use that as a reasoning behind why you're not deserving of being reelected? Has oh. anyone tried to use that and say that uh, he can't do the job, he's too far away? Of course, of course. <laughs> My detractors, that, they'll look for anything. And this seemed like a pretty easy attack line. And, um, y- you know, I've made every board meeting in Syosset in person since September. And the reason I do that is because I truly feel it's important for people to see me at the board meetings. And I go home often because I think it's important for me to gain a pulse on what's going on in the community. So they tried to use that, but there's nothing to use. I'm at every single board meeting in person. I come in all the time. And remember, as I've, as I've gotten the word out, the majority of the board responsibility is correspondence. It's email with the superintendent and my colleagues. People who have problems have no problems calling my cell phone. It's analyzing board documents online. And it's disseminating information via Facebook. So the majority of the job is virtual. So they haven't really been able to use that. But it's, it's, it was a nice try. Josh, uh, being on the school board, now having done a, a term successfully, is there anything that maybe surprised you that you thought, well, this wouldn't be that hard, but it ended up being more difficult, specifically about the job? Um, about the job. So, the, you know, we had a crazy year last year because we cleaned house. 
you know, we have new superintendent, we have you know, new attorneys, new bond counsel, new architects, um, two new principals. So the sheer volume of kind of the interview process and you know the you know debating of candidates that was it was a lot, and it's something I've you know I've never done before. You know, as a senior in high school, you know, of course, you know, I was on the committee that we interviewed students for peers as leaders, but that was a couple periods in high school, and you were happy to miss a couple periods in high school. <laughs> but this was, I mean, you know, weeks of. You know, deliberation and and these decisions, you know, you know, would really affect our buildings in our district. So just, I was surprised at just the sheer volume of the interview process and how big of a process it is. But I'm thrilled that I was a part of that because I'm so proud that we're able to call Dr. Rogers our superintendent. And the fact that you know I was one of nine to hire him is such a good feeling. And, and finally, Josh, just. From where you were in 2012 to where you are right now, how much better of a candidate are you this time around with three years of experience under your belt at this position and three more years of maturity under your belt and a year of college? Just your growth from where you were in 2012 to where you are now, how much better do you think that makes you as far as being a qualified candidate goes? So I think there's an exponential difference between what, where I was in 2012 and 2015. And I'm still, you know, I'm still the same person in terms of my values and my accessibility to the community. But what's different is that I've just learned learned a lot more. You know, three years on the board, I've availed myself of so much of the continuing education for school board members uh, from the New York State School Board Associations. I went to two national conferences, three state conferences, dozens of trainings. And you workshops. were in Nashville, I think, a couple of weeks ago. Nashville. Nashville. You're everywhere. You're in Vegas. So you're all over the I place. In, that's right. Well, I was in Vegas with, yeah, with my family, but I was in Nashville um, for the New York State School Board Association. I'm sorry, for the National School Board Association, Association's conference. I was the sole representative from Syosset. And it's opened my eyes to the fact that other districts, whether I had dinner with a, a woman from a rural town in, in Minnesota, a couple hundred kids in the district, and their district was five to one, capability to have five devices for one kid. And that's a small town. And you look at Syosset, top 200 national high school, big powerhouse district. It kind of opened my eyes to how far behind we are. But in terms of as a candidate, uh, I definitely think that you know I'm, I'm way more qualified just because of of everything that I know now. I, I understand the job. There's no need for me to make a transition. This is my job, you know, and uh, and I love the job, and I have a great understanding of what the job is and. The fact that I'm able to now couple an understanding of a job in my first term with an action plan in the second term with people on the board who are ready to support bold and progressive action, I think there's, the sky's the limit as to what we can do. Two things before we let you go, Josh. Sure. Uh, first things first. Do you feel uh, you went to Nashville? You were the only, you just said you were the only representative of the school of the school board to make that trip. Obviously, that's funded by the school board. Why do you think you were the only one that wanted to make the trip? Maybe you learned new things that you could incorporate to SIASA. Why is it that you were the only one that wanted to take that trip? So for, it's funny. For years, Dr. Hankin didn't want trustees going to conferences because she she kept them insulated and she didn't want them to learn. So my first year on the board, you know, Dr. Hankin, nobody wanted me to go to the New York State School Board Association conference in Rochester, and it was really too bad. It was too bad. I sought counsel from trustees in other districts, and they said, it's, it's absolutely your right to go and go. And I was the first trustee to, to really to start going to conferences. The fact that we had all nine board members went to the New York State Conference in the city this year, that never happened. I led that change. And it's because the only way to grow is to benchmark yourself. The fact that we we weren't benchmarking ourselves, for the fact that I got criticized at the candidate debate in 2012 for for looking to Jericho and looking to what they do is good is crazy, and it's a problem with this country as well. We we love to applaud ourselves and pat ourselves on the back, but we we hate to look at what other countries are doing well. And as a school district, you know there are so many other districts who are doing amazing things. It's time, and we're doing it now to look at what they're doing and replicate it ourselves. If I'm a if I'm a college student. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm, you know, well, I am a college student, but I'm talking hypothetically for other college students. And I'm coming home, and I'm a member of the Syosset School District, or even if I'm not a college student, and, and I'm in, live in the district, and I want to get involved in the Josh Lavazan campaign. What do I have to do? First thing you got to do is you got to shoot me a message on Facebook, shoot me an email, Josh Lavazan at gmail dot com. Um, call, call my cell phone. You you can find me online, and you got to let me know right away. Because as I said, starting tomorrow, you know, we we you know we we're, we're getting into the single digits of days until the election. But the second thing is that we need help, you know, we need a ton of help distributing flyers, making phone calls. But the biggest thing you can do, and it's twofold, you got to get your friends out to the polls. As I said, young people, we vote 
the lowest numbers of any demographic. We don't vote. And that's why we often don't get good results yielded for us in, in county government and state government. Youth funding is the first thing to go. You don't see senior funding going right away. You don't see funding for veterans going right away. You don't see funding for other interest groups, but you see youth funding cut because we don't vote. So you got to vote. you got to make sure your friends vote. you got to make sure your parents vote. And if you're around, drop me a line. We're going to need help because we, we, we want to put a flyer in every door in Syosset. And we'll certainly see if you'll be able to do that. But, Josh, thank you so much for a couple minutes coming on the show. We've wanted to do this for a long time. Sure. It was great to get you in here. And for those who are listening on Tape Delay, we thank you. For those catching this interview live, we appreciate it. But that is all the time we have. But, Josh, once again, thank you yeah, so much. Yeah, thanks so much, Josh. really means a lot. Uh, you know, I'm sure everyone's going to love to hear uh, what you got to say. Because I, I think you, you have made a difference in the district. I think you, you are the type of person that young people look up to as a uh, as a role model. It means so much. And I just want to give a plug for the two of you guys. You know, full this disclosure these two are two of my best friends and they're so talented at what they do and you, you'll be hearing them for a while on the radio on tv but make sure you look these guys up because they're going places josh thanks so much really appreciate that it was josh last everybody make sure you get out to the polls on may 19th and support lavazan hart and feldman what is it number three four and three, five, four and five so sciastic and thrive so there you go that was josh lavazan everybody thank you for joining us now back to the hit music right here on vic radio Listening to the Asmund and Budic podcast. Make sure you go on to iTunes and subscribe to the show.